Hello everybody and thank you for joining. This is your host Nino and in today's episode we shall be exploring something special. A book from 2020 by Nils Holm called List from Nothing. And in this book he is venturing deeply into Lisp 1.5 and describing you how to create a compiler and an interpreter. Now, this is something I haven't seen in any other similar way elsewhere. A modern book on something truly ancient. The only thing I struggle with in recommending it is that it is more written like a sort of brain dump like a stream of thought and would have certainly profited from somewhat more structure. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it and have a look at what it is about. Already on page three in the preface, he tells you the elements of the most minimal lisp. He does extend them by setq and progn if I remember correctly, later on. And he very quickly tells you that he wants to create a compiler as well as an interpreter and also makes clear, like already here, and already makes clear on page 6 that it would be good for you to already know Lisp and know what S expressions are. In general, and perhaps not unexpected for somebody who would write such a book, it becomes quite apparent that the guy likes to feel special, sort of. Let me make that a bit larger. He's writing a role model with a circumflex. And while that might be correct in French, I mean, that's unusual for English to say the least. Anyway, so that you will see throughout the book, little things where he felt special and where he put a little bit of trivia, among other things. But that's actually quite interesting to read. Then, on page 11, he's showing you um, a little bit, he's talking a little bit about M expressions, which I find funny because that's the only time I see that in a sort of modern book. And what I do find actually quite charming is how he is comparing the use of and not and or and the use of cond that you can in fact replace cond if you will in a way through and or and not that's that's not bad that's actually quite an interesting idea so there is then a in-depth discussion of how exactly to transfer such M expression ideas into S expressions, something I haven't quite seen anywhere else. And what is also quite funny on page 13, um, do you remember that book by McCarthy from, I know that's actually the, apparently the previous edition. Here he is correcting his evil. He says that there were a couple of mistakes there and here you can see apparently an evil being corrected. I haven't ever seen anyone else collect, correct McCarthy's evils from the 60s so that's actually <laughs> quite a quite an unexpected endeavor right. Then on page 20 he goes forward to tell you the elements of a most minimal lisp and yeah, these are the ones he mentioned already. 
and continues to to tell a little bit about it how how you can extend this through further um, through further elements. So here he gives you apparently a minimal meta circular list in a, in a single label. So that's basically his return to McCarthy and like how would he be doing it? How would you define label he also describes? And what is interesting is that he is using scheme for his experiment. Now, I completely concur in that, that scheme is perhaps closer to old lisp than actually common lisp. And let's make a jump into antiquity. Page 32, 33. Here, you're getting an in-depth outline of how this thing was working with a punch cards and uh, awesome advantages of the Frieden Flexor writer to which he indeed returns later on and what I personally found quite interesting what he suggests may have been the Lisp character set which I always asked myself like if you do not have 256 characters which ones are really necessary for Lisp Certainly modern Lisp would need a couple more for arrays and whatnot. But, or no, for characters. But it's interesting to know that with this, in general terms, you likely can come by, if in a pinch. In particular, if, for instance, you're making your own keyboard. So that's not an entirely theoretical remark I'm making here. <laughs> so... Then he tells you how it was to work with punch cards. And I mean, he tells it to you in details. Like, deleting a line from a program was easy, you just toss the card. But, but how you also had to, you know, correct things, which he, yeah, describes here, that if you make here an error and forget the B, how you would have exactly to repunch your card, but you could reuse that part, but would need to continue this part in you. I must say, these are details I was certainly not aware of. And somewhere here he also mentions that um, the punch cards were not actually encoding things. Let me see what I can find that. We're not just encoding things in a purely binary fashion, but that, yeah, that they were using something called 12-channel encoding, where there are 12 positions for whole characters, uh, with, or like for punch, punches through the card, with three holes per character at most, in order to avoid that the card becomes too lacy, too, la too much, with too many holes and loses, therefore, structural stability. So, thanks for the details, I was certainly not aware of them, and I find it very interesting that somebody in the 2020s gives you a very in-depth dive into how to work with punch cards. Well, and then, actually, he starts to talk about how to build the smallest Lisp interpreter. And he's going to be writing that in C, is given in the end of the appendix. And then he actually discusses all sorts of details about it, like the most minimal functions he's going to implement, and so on and so forth. And then follow all sorts of details about how he would be going about uh, implementing his Lisp. And what C functions you will be using. And he mentions already here 
Note that some details of the following descriptions may not make much sense right now. They will be described later. Uh, clarified later. Now, that exactly mentions the style of the book which I outlined to you in the beginning. Things are written, in fact, a little bit like a stream of thought. All right. So, well, that that's my only issue with it. Other than that, it shows you quite interesting and tricky stuff, like, for instance, here on page 86, uh, this con statement up there, that con tfu bar bas will compile the same way as just fu. Indeed, everything after the truth clause is simply sort of switched off, right? Because it will never be reached. And then, on page 125, again we switch to funny trivia of <laughs> doubtful utility in a way about how to know the end of a file. And here he goes to a good in-depth explanation of how CPM was putting in the file a control Z character. I mean, that's true. And in particular, if you look at older files from BBS, they are often full with control Z characters. But exactly how this is much related to um, Lisp is perhaps a different question, right? Now, also interesting is this uh, page 126, yes. Punch card spacing discussion or was it elsewhere? The spacing of the parenthesis. He had it here somewhere. Yeah, here. That there was sometimes space left on purpose between the character punches in order not to damage the card structurally when punching it. I mean, awesome. Just awesome. And then he pursues the fun question on, on page 131. Would it run on an IBM 704? I love the question. In particular also because, I mean, have you one lying around? But it is nonetheless a very interesting here, short outline of how many Lisp cells you could sort of count on in an early Lisp system. And we're talking here 20,000 cells, which is pretty much nowadays microcontroller level. All right. And then comes quite a laudatio, quite an unusual one for the Frieden Flexer writer. What an amazing thing it was that it was not only a typewriter but also a teletypewriter. And how much more interactive things were using the amazing Frieden Flexer writer. And then you've got a little bit of details how exactly a Frieden Flexer writer was operating, and in particular how Backspace was operating, that it was <coughs> reprinting things just underlined. So now you're well equipped in case you need to use a Freedom Flexor Writer. By the way, this was not only on the Freedom Flexor Writer. This was a thing throughout the era of punching ter of, um, hard copy terminals. In fact, if I recall correctly, the RSX operating system was doing something very much like that. Like all these DEX systems and so on. Early Unix too. Either some special character will be printed or the deleted characters will be printed in reverse. 
Okay. Now he is telling you how Evil Quote would be working. And what he mentions is that prior to Lisp 1.5, there was even a third element, uh, namely the environment. But that in Lisp 1.5, that was just simply assumed to be nil. I was not aware of that. And it's of course one further complication, which is good that they got rid of it. And then on page 147, he's showing you something interesting that define was used at the time with a list of definitions. So you give one list with multiple function definitions and, and not one define per function definition as it is, you know, nowadays. But even at the time, if I recall correctly, the PDP1 would demand one per, like one function per definition. But in the 1790, things were of course different. And then comes the interpreter source, like some, some, some all sorts of discussions about that. Interpreter source code starts here, and that goes on for a couple of tens of pages. And so we skip forward to 167. It's interesting because here he explains you homoeconicity, and that this is why Lisp is so cool. He also goes into interesting details about macros up there that setting up things like this for instance and delivering a quote it takes would not truly deliver you an unevaluated quote it takes but would rather give you something which only looks like that and so he thereby demonstrates why a macro where you really avoid such evaluation, it might be a good facility. And then he goes later on into recursive macros and whatnot. We shall skip ahead to page 186 or something like here, or 184. Yeah, he also talks, and that's quite interesting, about binding strategies. How are variables bound in Lisp? So, in particular, about lexical scoping and dynamic scoping. And the idea being that in modern Lisp dialects, scoping is lexical. That is, the binding depends on where the definition is, whereas in older Lisp dialects it was often dynamic, which meant when an element has been accessed. So he, he gives you here an idea of how you can test whether your Lisp is binding lexically or dynamically. And the question really is, whether you're changing that X or not with, with the quote dynamic or lexical. So, uh, he actually talks again about scoping over here, page 200 and one in the topic of temporary variables and then goes also into garbage collection and things like that and what he then does in the end which is really quite funny he does a benchmark where is it i think i skipped it yeah the performance of his interpreter he tests with a variant of the Takeuchi function, 
and comes up with such times, so his interpreted lisp is rather slow, whereas his compiled lisp is actually rather decent compared to some more modern dialects. And as we are approaching actually the end, here he gives you also on page 2021 20, a good idea of what machines one dealt with at the time. So 256k of words from some 32k, so 32k to 256k and like uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 MIPS, like million instructions per second machine. So, again, nowadays these are actually microcontroller levels. He also mentions a really funny detail I was not aware of previously, though I may have seen it somewhere and hold it a bit. But this is really truly crazy that the default number base in MacLisp was octal. I mean, yeah, I mean, wow, <laughs> that's that's not very practical, but certainly surprising, because octal looks similar enough to decimal that you are puzzled, like why your nine is not working. Anyway, and then he talks about how the systems felt, how the IBM behemoths were remote, and then the PDP-10 was much more hands-on and that memory barriers were reached repeatedly for the PDP-10 in the late 70s. And that then even more hands-on this machines appeared. Let me see that here. As single user machines. Yeah, like basically this one. So and then in the end, things went down to microcomputers and that nowadays you basically have common lisp and scheme and auto lisp and a couple of strange dialects. But that these times of the blossom are perhaps a little over. Well, I dare say that lisp dialects continue to be actually evolving and created. And I would just like to mention evidently closure and the racket, and also high on top of Python. And then he continues to suggest further improvements on his Lisp systems, until in the end he actually gives you also a little manual for it. which is this. And that, I believe, is quite an unusual feat for a book from 2020. Quite an achievement to create such an antique system in modern times. And so, quirky as it is, I found the book quite enjoyable, though, of course, this is as far from practical as one can get. Then again, life is certainly not about being practical, right? So with that, I hope you enjoyed today's review. I hope to greet you here soon again as regular guests. I wish you a wonderful day. And from me, goodbye.